John, it's an honor to have you on our podcast, the West Coast Business Show. Uh, one of the most successful Irish men in Canada. Thank you for taking the time. I know you are, William. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tell us a bit about uh, your story. Um, Transcode Group of Companies, uh, it's a phenomenal success story and uh, we'd love to hear it. Okay, so my wife and I and my very young daughter emigrated from uh, Ireland in uh, 1982. <clears throat> and during that period between 82 and 86, uh, I decided to figure out what Canadian life was. And so I worked for a lot of restaurants. Um, you know, one of, the, one, of the, one of the best ones I worked for, believe it or believe it not, was I was a manager at McDonald's restaurant. And I found with McDonald's that I didn't have to go to business university because they taught me everything that I needed to know, like counting straws once a month. Um, so uh, in 86, I was involved with a supermarket, uh, as in working, managing a supermarket uh, in Ottawa called Valdi Foods. And at that time, I used to be smoking, so I went out for a cigarette one day, and uh, I used to see this trailer uh, about 10.30 in the morning with all these white things that looked like a space machine on the back of the trailer. And uh, basically, I decided one day I was going to be ready, so I followed the trailer in my car. And when the guy stopped, who ended up being one of my best friends, a guy called Brown Vondershoot in Ottawa, uh, basically, uh, I, he was explained to me that on the back of the trailer was ice cream bicycles. And that kind of blew my mind. So I figured it out with him as to how it was going to, uh, you know, how these, what's the whole system with the, with the business. And uh, I ended up, uh, I ended up uh, uh, taking it, taking on the business for half of Ottawa, right? And then while I was doing that, I changed my job again from the supermarket down to the reader center. I was managing the food court. And the pressure of both jobs kind of got me, and my wife recommended to me, that uh, I should uh, quit one of the jobs. And uh, so basically I had one job with a steady income and another, another job that was weather orientated and not necessarily steady. If it rained, you didn't make any money because your bikes wasn't going out. So my wife just said, you know, you really have to just pick one. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work. And I said, yeah, okay, I, you know, she was right. And uh, so I picked one, so I came home about uh, three days, and you know, it took about three days to think about it. Then came home from my supper one night, and I sat down and I said to my wife, Erin, and I said, listen, I've made up my mind, and uh, I've done something about it. And she said, so what did you do? Now, she fully expected me to quit the, the ice cream bicycles and stick with the job that was paying me money every week, but I didn't. I quit the job that was paying me money every week, and I kept going with the ice cream bicycles. And thanks be to God I did that. But anyway, so that kind of shocked my wife. I didn't know whether she was ready to kill me or divorce me or whatever. Um, so things uh, progressed from there. So from about, nine, that was in 1986, March the 1st, 1986. And uh, things progressed from there. And um, I was uh, building my business up and putting these ice cream bicycles out, which is now a rarity. Uh, but uh, basically, I managed, or sorry, I ran anywhere from eight ice cream bicycles up to a high of 50 ice cream bicycles. So if you can imagine that every morning you'd have to come in, obviously with help, and you have to load those ice cream bicycles full of ice cream. And then you have to, at the end of the night, at the end of the evening, you have to offload all those bicycles from ice cream. And in the meantime, count what was sold and balance with the with the sales agent and uh, and pay them, and uh, away they go, and uh, everything was every single day you do that. So that was uh, that was an interesting um, thing. Um, at that time, my daughter was about eight years of age, and uh, I think I'm the guy that must have started off child labor because that's the first day she started working for me or with me. So we. Uh, Continued on with that business, and uh, I transferred from Ottawa down to uh, Kingston, which was, again, another very good choice, and I had the city of Kingston to myself, and uh, basically the business kept on growing from there. In about 1988, Dickie D Ice Cream, which is the name of the company that, 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 um, 
that was owned by two brothers, um, and it was right across Canada. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, <coughs> Dickie D Ice Cream, uh, basically, um, the concept was that, that, that uh, you know, you put these ice cream bicycles out and you pay your staff every day, and that was great. And then what happened was, around the late 80s, McDonald's and everybody else out there started coming into town and they took a lot of my labor force, which was primarily uh, teenagers, away. Um, but I continued uh, with, with my core uh, amount of people and, uh, and that worked out very well. Um, we uh, went from there and uh, Dickie D Ice Cream came up with uh, a new product called Richard D. Uh, which is the adult version of Dickie D. And it was an ice cream bar in a box. And then what they did is they developed these freezers with a bubble top on top of them. And uh, that's what a person can see in. And then we placed them all over the place. Uh, for me, Eastern Ontario, uh, from uh, Belleville, Trenton, all the way to Cornwall. So I placed them all, all out there in garages and stuff like that, where there wasn't primarily ice cream being sold. And uh, we did very, very, very well with that. 1992, Unilever bought out Dickie D Ice Cream, and um, they partnered up with a, a dairy at the time called Beatrice, which is now Parmalat, uh, and uh, basically they, Parmalat themselves, wanted their own distributors to carry ice cream, but I was the Irish guy that just wouldn't go away, and uh, so I stuck it in there, and basically of all in Kingston, Ontario, of the eight distributors they had selling ice cream, Beatrice, I was selling more than all eight combined, so which was uh, which was a phenomenal success uh, for me, and that was all due to my team and my staff and all that. Um, 19, uh, 19, let's fast forward to 1999. Uh, basically, uh, the Parmalat and Unilever agreement uh, uh, fell apart. And uh, Unilever hired me as a consultant, and they wanted me to come out to the West Coast and work with a, an icon of mine, may you rest in peace, a gentleman by the name of Mohan Tawani. And uh, what we had to do was reset up all, all the West Coast. So we did that, and, and then that was great. And then they decided they were going to go into the mass distributorship, which is what Transcold is today. Is a massive distributor of Unilever products, as in ice cream products. And uh, basically, um, the master distributorship. So then we, uh, they decided to put the same program right across the country. But they had offered me uh, British Columbia and Alberta as I being the first master distributor until they said no. BC and Alberta is going to go last, and John can get that business as long as he helps us open the other two, the other three places, which was basically um, Ontario and uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan. Yeah, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and uh, and the East Coast there, Newfoundland, and all that. So Mohan and I, I, I didn't mind. I was getting very well paid by Unilever anyway, so I was. Uh, uh, I was out there getting the job done, and, uh, and finally it came in 2002, November 2002, which was the uh, first day for Transcold to start doing business, and uh, the rest is history. I guess we are where we are today. Um, again, I have to recognize the fact that this is a, this is an opportunity. This is a a job that could not be done by just me. I developed and, and have very, very, very good staff, very dedicated staff working with me in my business and only for them and my family, I'd be on an ice cream bicycle selling ice cream. There you go. Uh, started off selling ice cream on a bike mm -hmm. to where you are today. What year did you come to Vancouver, John? I came to Vancouver on March the 1st, 1999. 1999. Yeah, I came to Canada in 82. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Where from? Uh, place Limerick, Limerick City. You know, winner of five All Irelands. I'll have to say that. You know what I mean? In a row. You know, <laughs> no pun to poor William there. You know, they got lucky. They got lucky <laughs> a few times. <laughs> I don't know the yeah. references. <laughs> uh, he knows. Hurling is like uh, uh, 
one of our national sports in Ireland. And um, it's very similar to lacrosse and hockey. Yeah. And uh, it's been going on for over 3,000 years back in Ireland. And uh, there's 32 counties in Ireland, as you know. But yeah. uh, every year we fight for the title. Uh, and it's kind of like the Super Bowl. So the county that John is from, Limerick, uh, have won it the last few years. In Five years. <laughs> Let me stress that. A couple of years. <laughs> but they're, they're exceptional. Very, very good players. And the sport, you, you told me about this, but I've actually looked it up and watched a bit of it. It's, it's, it's great. great. The, the, those guys are, uh, they, they, they look like yeah. they've done a lot of running. They're just they bad. are incredible athletes. Yeah. And you have to remember that these guys all have full-time jobs. You know, this is an amateur sport. And it's regional. You, like, you can't go play in some el someone else's region, No, right? that's right. You have to play with the area or the county that you're from. So yeah. uh, it makes it very, I think there's a lot of passion there. Yeah, and, like uh, yeah, uh -huh. um, it's incredible. But uh, these guys are super, and girls, uh, are super athletes. It's just... So it's, this is going 3,000 years. So when you were a kid, it was big, and then it just... Oh, yeah, massive and yeah. good, yeah, for sure. The um, the uh, thing about it, the thing to, that that hasn't been explained to you is that when my father-in-law, for example, who was a fine herder in his day, a lot of mercy in him, uh, but uh, when he played, so we say 50s and late 60s, even early 70s, if you watch the sport on TV, right, uh, you'll see the boys have helmets and then this big stick, mm -hmm. we call it a hurley, right, okay? Well, they used to play that sport with no helmets, right? So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't unusual to see somebody come down with a split head and blood all the way down his street. You swear he was in a run with Tyson or Cassius Clay for, uh, for 15 minutes, you know what I mean? I'm not that old yeah. now, but I played hurling without a helmet. You did? I did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine. So one, of the not, one of the comments on our, on our YouTube is about some, you gave someone a, uh, an injury. Oh, no, yeah. that must have been someone <laughs> Somebody else. Somebody tracked you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Donovan would never that do that. It couldn't have been me. No. Huh? Uh, yeah. There must be mistaken me for yeah. someone else. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's why I got, I have a scar here on my lip. I got seven stitches. Yeah. I've oh. broken almost every bone in my body. My legs a couple of times, my arms. Oh. I've had uh, my rotator cuffs, major surgery on both shoulders. Oh, wow. Uh, one about a year ago and one 15 years ago. So it's a pretty, there's a lot of, lot of heavy contact. Yeah, um, for sure, yeah. And yeah. at those games, so for example, the All-Ireland Final, which happens in September each year. Um, sorry, it's a bit earlier now. Sometimes it could be uh, uh, July or August. But uh, there can be 85,000 people at those games in the stadium in Dublin called Crow Park. It's the biggest in, in Europe. And this is an amateur oh. sport. So... It's, it's serious stuff, yeah, and it's amazing to go to. Last year, I had uh, the pleasure of getting a couple of very good tickets from the Canadian GAA here, and uh, I went to see the final, uh, Limerick and yeah. Kilkenny. And when they, them players were marching around the field um, at the start of the game, and you got 85,000 people there screaming, it was just... I mean, they, they, they the ambulance standing on the back of my neck. I've never been 85,000 people, so I don't even know what that's uh -huh. like. And I, and I was a neutral, so I could enjoy it, because if Galway, where I'm from, if they were playing, I'd be too nervous to enjoy it, because, yeah, yeah. you know, it's a yeah. big day. But uh, it, was, it was something else to take that in, and to, to think that that's an amateur sport, and these people are out here competing at this level, uh, and the fitness, and the physique, and uh, they, don't get any, they don't get any money for it. I, it because you know, we've talked a little bit about Irish culture on the show, and so I'm sort of starting to piece it together just a little bit, and uh -huh. feeling more and more left out because I've never even been there. <laughs> so one day, um, but and I, we want, there's lots we want to cover today. But I just something that always when people come to another country, in this case you coming to Canada, is the the people that have success here, and but just being away from that. That like the culture things that just because I've never left Canada. I've left for about you know a month at a time maybe or a couple weeks at a time even, and I'm still glad to get back home because it's just so being Canadian is just I don't even think about being Canadian. It's just deep deep inside me, and I just wonder what is that like? What, everybody's experience is different. What was it like for you making that choice, leaving all that behind, starting over with your wife, raising a family here? I came out about um, six months to nine months prior to my wife. We didn't have any money. 
we, uh, you know, um, the only thing that, that I had going for me was basically, I guess I had the energy uh, to do things. Um, I had four years of doing different jobs and stuff like that. And no disrespect to the Canadians, but, um, you know, I figured it out very quickly that the only way that I could make serious money was be the master of my own destiny. Mm-hmm. So in other words, work for myself. So I was building myself slowly but surely to get that. I didn't even know anything about Dickie D. Ice cream. It was a fluke. Um, I, uh, you know, but the concept was there. I was willing to put in the work, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, and so I would work a lot of hours. I would work, I could work 14 hours in a day, have four hours sleep and back at it again or whatever, right? You know what I mean? I always said that um, during my early years that, uh, you know, I've got uh, two kids, well, adults. They're about as old as you are now. But anyway, they, um, my wife reared my children, okay? We two. And kept the household together and, and worked hard in that way so that I could focus on my own business, right? Now, my wife also worked my business as well. But, um, yeah, so that's, that, that's what's very important. So when you come to Canada, you have to figure out. Now, the other thing is... I didn't have anything to fall back on. In fairness to William and a lot of other guys I know, they were smart enough to have a trade in your back pocket. You know what I mean? So if you need to fall back on something, you've got a trade, you go out and you work your trade, right? I think that's very important for the new Irish coming over here as well. Um, The opportunities are still there, right? But they're fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer, you know, as, as you go along, right? So... Basically, I started working for myself um, again in 1986. So 19, say, late, late 86, early 87 was when I, was, when I quit my, my job at that restaurant crowd uh, in the Reader Center and just went with Dickie D full time on that. And uh, yeah, it was a great job. I like being outside. I like people. Um, yeah, so there's opportunities. So for people coming over here, again, just make sure you've... you've uh, looked at uh, everything, like every possibility there is, both positive and negative, uh, before you make that big decision in, in, in coming to Canada. Right? That's it. Before we move on, I must say, I had the pleasure to spend time with Erin, many of the time, and uh, she's a lovely lady. Thank you. And I know they say, uh, behind every good man is a good woman, or an Absolutely. even better woman, and that's certainly the case uh, there, and in my own uh, scenario as well. But... Um, uh, I also met uh, Melissa a few times. Uh-huh. She is, I know, a huge part of Transcode group of companies now and uh-huh. a lovely lady too. Uh-huh. And uh, she and your son. So uh-huh. um, well done and congratulations there too because that's, thank you uh, You know, to raising kids all, all ahead of you. Oh, congratulations yeah, yeah. to yeah, yourself. Yeah, three weeks in. Three weeks the in with a new baby. Jared, yeah. just oh, telling you. Okay. And, on that, and on that, we should give you this, Jared, before I forget. This is a small little gift for... Esme. Oh, to me. To you. Oh, yeah, okay. To Esme. You deserve it. Yeah. Thank you but, very uh, much. Yes, to that you. Is very so, nice. uh, Thank you. Congratulations again. Um, Thank you. That was, I was not expecting uh, that. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Erin is a lovely lady, and um, that's uh, certainly the case in our household as well, John. I think we. It is. You're very similar. As an entrepreneur, I think if you want to be successful, you need to give it 110%. Oh, yeah. And to be able to do that, you have to have the right partner and when I say partner I mean life partner Mm -hmm. uh, business partner you know Mm -hmm. so your second half Mm -hmm. and uh, I think when you get that right um, it's a huge advantage because Mm -hmm. if you don't it can be an absolute nightmare you know so they have to understand us Mm -hmm. I think as entrepreneurs we have to be a little bit crazy and they put up with that and um, even whether we want to admit it or not but uh, uh, that's so important Mm -hmm. it is and it's it's something I think even in Today's today's culture, I don't think it's quite as talked about as much as it as it used to be. Um, is that importance of that dynamic at home? Mm-hmm. Because it does take so much out of you to actually mm-hmm. build a successful business to really do it. Mm-hmm. You know, and I don't mean just make a living, but have success. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you're going home and you're just dealing with <laughs> yeah, that it doesn't it, work. You know, and I, I met your wife uh, mm-hmm. just and just lovely. Um, you know, and talking about her kids, but she's here and engaged, and, and you, you can you can sense right away if someone's supporting. You, yeah, you can meet them in two minutes. Someone's partner, and you know right away if they're into it or not. 
Yes. I've, I've met the officer. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, yeah, no, he's great. And they're like, uh-huh. You're like, I think, I think <laughs> that on. both our wives are quite similar because they're very good at... Uh, They'll, uh, they'll watch what you're doing and then basically they'll let the slack run out a bit. <laughs> but then suddenly when they pull it back in, you're getting choked. <laughs> yeah. You go back and you say, yes, dear. You know yes, dear. Yeah. 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 That's for you know? sure. So, John, uh, um, as a, a serial entrepreneur and somebody that has huge success and that has built your business from the ground up, um, what advice would you give to somebody uh, starting a business? Um, what what qualities uh, do you need to be successful? Um, let us know. I think, um, first of all, what do you need to be successful in a business? Just read the William Donlan book of being successful and you'll be okay. <laughs> um, you need to be a people person. I think you need to, very, very, very uh, important is number one, you need to be honest and truthful. Very second of all, you need to be uh, a people person. You need to have people, um, you ha and you have to work for it, is you need people to trust you. Um, uh, and uh, basically, you, you uh, want you, and then on top of that, m most important as well, is that you need your family support in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. If your family doesn't support what you're doing, you're hooked, right? But, um, yeah, so you definitely need that. Um, Again, so that, that's, you know, honesty, uh, trustworthy, um, you know, family support. Yeah, I love that. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's the first time I've asked somebody that question, and they've said honesty and trustworthy, and, and I, I agree, it's so important. Yeah. Um, somebody said to me one time, if you always tell the truth, you'll never get caught up telling lies. Yeah. Uh, and that's so true. You'll have nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for yourself as well, you know, to be an honest person. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I have that. It, yeah. yeah. One, two, when you, you said about that, I, again, thinking of other people, and, and I'm going to blame entertainment a little bit because the successful businessman in the movies so often is the biggest sleazeball. And it, it, they, do, they, they do that set up. And I know why, because it's, you know, the underdog has to come up. I, know, I get why mm -hmm. it makes a good story. But it actually can paint in a culture a misunderstanding of it. Like, and, and both of you, I'm interested. Like, in my life, actual sleazeball, successful people, I mean, I'd have to think about it. I, I'm sure I've met two, but I haven't met ten. Yeah. Like, the people that I've seen and met and got, and I do I meet a lot because of just the nature of my job, they, I mean, their success is because when they say they're going to phone you, when they say they're going to do something, when they're going to do business with you, it's rock solid. Yeah. And the, the other people get, just get weeded. And you see some people trying to get into business, and they, they haven't figured that out yet. And they're kind of, you know, they're, they're late, they're this, they're that. And they just disappear. A couple of years later, you go to the same event. They're not around anymore. They don't mm. make it. And I'm, it, it, has yeah. it been, I mean, you've had a, a longer career. William, you know, you've been around. Well, is, is it similar? Mm -hmm. To add to that is basically what happens uh, quite a bit, especially when you're an entrepreneur is that um, a lot of people start off very, very good businesses and they're working and they're working hard at it. And then they start getting a taste of success and then that starts to go into their head. Yeah. And uh, basically, and so then what happens is they're spending more time entertaining or being entertained yeah. rather than focusing on their business, right? I mean, when you have your own business, that business is all about you. Right, not you know, not somebody that you're paying fifty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year, and then you're not even involved. Like you know what I mean? You just oh yeah, well Jack will take care of it or yeah. whatever, right? Yeah. And that's a that's a major um, reason why businesses fail. Not just for the Irish, but for everybody that comes out here, right? Um, you know, and so you have to be self. I guess the word I'm looking at here, looking for here, is you got to be self-disciplined, yeah. right? You know what I mean? Yeah. We, we have a saying in our company, uh, but we don't like trumpet it out. It's not on our website, but sure. variation is evil. <laughs> yeah. We say it all the time. In our, yeah. My, yeah. my partner and I do. We don't say it to our team all the time. We're yeah. a little old. But we say it all the time uh -huh. is that starting to chase a dollar, um, you know, oh, we can make money here. We can make, well, yeah, you make money everywhere. Yeah. That, that's not where you're good at, where you're good at making money, uh -huh. but also with play. Yeah. You know, I, I keep it to, I play a little bit of chess. 
little bit of boxing, mm-hmm. a little bit of shooting. But I and I could do so many. There's so many other things. I drive by a you know a bow and arrow store. And I go, oh, I think I could get into that. <laughs> but it would now take four, five, six hours out of my week. And a lot. Start chasing. You know, a boat. Yeah. A boat. You got to yeah. load it. You got to. And all of a sudden. That's right. Uh, you know, you're taking up that time. I have a business so, coach. So you, sorry, go ahead. Right. Sorry, I have a business coach, and she tells the story where uh, I believe uh, it was Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Bill Gates were interviewed together. And uh, at the end of the interview, they were asked to write down the most important word in business. Or just one word. Mm. And they were given a piece of paper uh, off the cuff, and they all wrote down the word focus. That was it. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Focus. Yeah, yeah. So I'm always trying to, you know, uh, tell myself and uh, our teams absolute focus. There's so many distractions out there. Mm-hmm. You know, we need to focus, and and if you do focus and focus on the right things, focus you have a great thing. chance of being. You're going to focus on something. Yeah. Yeah. No, Your for focus sure. Focus is going to go somewhere. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and through the years, have you seen? There, I'm not asking you to call anybody out yeah. specific, yeah. but have you? Are there people that come to mind that you go that they could have done so much more and they just lost? They just lost it, you know. Again, playing, buying the boat, buying the not that that stuff is bad. I've seen a lot of people of that has um, basically uh, developed a huge ego uh, mm. problem, and that's what killed them. And they, I don't want to say killed them. I'm sorry, but that's what um, that's what killed their business. I suppose uh, in the end is you know they thought you know oh, I, I got a couple of you know grand in my pocket and this and that. Well, that couple of grand is going to go very fast. You always have to think about the future and all that kind of stuff. But I just want to go back because I was very interested in your interests. And one of them was uh, shooting. And what was the other one? Uh, chess and boxing. Chess not and boxing. not exceptional in any three of those. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm not going to piss you off, okay? All right? I'll stay away from you now. That's you probably okay. could You're a I'm violent man, here. I think. <laughs> I'm a country we, boy. It's um, just, yeah. I was at a uh, shout out to, to Bob McAdam. I was at Sugar Ray's yesterday with our oh, six yeah. year olds. Yeah. 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 So we're all signed up. Yeah. We just had the owner of the boxing yeah. club. Oh, yeah. 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 We had, um, yeah. So the, the other thing with regards to business um, is, is your team. It's very, very important uh, that you develop a good team. And you can only start developing a good team is when you sit down and look in the mirror and say, okay, I'm the, I'm the owner or proprietor or whatever, what, what don't I like to do? What, what's in it? What, what don't I like to do? Or what am I weak at? Which is very, so you have a self to stop with yourself, right? And when you find out what you're weak at or what you don't like to do in the business, you hire people for those positions, right? And that will keep you going in what you're strong at. Rather, what you're weak at, now you've filled in people that's good at that, and then what you're strong at, you're taking care of yourself, right? And then you join them together as one team, right? Um, for example, would be uh, in any business, accounting is a big, big thing, taxes and all that kind of stuff, right? Now, I'm very good with numbers. I know that, okay? But when it comes down to taxes and all that kind of stuff, I should be in jail, all right? Because... <laughs> But She's I hired. Recorded, just so you know. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, because my, the rules that I have and the reason why I'm not in jail is I hired an expert accountant in house. My business uh, out there, sorry, people in a similar business to mine out there would have maybe three bookkeepers or three accountants or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. I have fourteen, right? Wow. And they handle every aspect of of the business, right? Okay. As my uh, late father used to say to me, take care of the pennies and the pounds will take care of themselves. So I always focus over here. And, you know, Melissa, my, the president of the company, she's on the big numbers and I'm like, okay. But I know that 100 pennies equals a pound. So take care of, take care of the pennies and the pounds will take care of yourself. It's good Irish saying, by the way. Um, but by having these people in a position that I'm weak at, I'm not saying I'm weak at it, but you know what I mean, I don't have time for, and having the experts over there, mm. that, that's another thing, is to place your people and have your people uh, you know, going properly. Transcode itself has approximately 195 to 205 employees, right, uh, just alone, that's between Transcode Canada and then Transcode USA, 
right? It will be expected to have probably another 25% growth next year as Transco is now heading out east, you know, slowly but surely. But again, taking our time, making sure every step that we take is the right thing. Uh, the other thing with regards to Transco, what we're doing now is that we uh, currently today are building a uh, 85,000 square foot uh, warehousing freezer uh, in uh, in Surrey, in South Surrey, or sorry, in Surrey, in Scott Road. Uh, that would be ready in October 2000, and where are we now? 24. 2024. Um, that will be ready then. Uh, but here's the thing for the listeners to imagine. Um, of that 85,000 or 90,000 square feet, uh, if you drive by there today, you will see a frame up there of a very, very big building, which is 63 foot high. Uh, and that is ju- that's 55,000 square feet, and that's just a freezer. That's so rich. imagine, close your head, no, William, freezer. <laughs> Fridges only <laughs> refrigerate. See, I have to educate the construction king here, right? Um, so that's that you know. So that's got a tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous opportunity for Transcold and for the Transcold team. Uh, again, um, yeah, that's a hell of a big freezer. I can tell you that right now. That's huge. So well, an acre and a half, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Massive. Yeah. Imagine that. Big, one of the Try biggest to here. That big freezer. Yeah, just right by there. You'll see it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and um, they have a competition every now and again, and what to do is the. The guys that staff amongst themselves, they'll take a popsicle and they will go into the freezer and they'll have a competition to see how many popsicles can, they can eat in the freezer before having to get out because they're frozen. <laughs> Twice a year we have uh, Just to jump back like to what you were saying, John, mm-hmm. our last guest, uh, Corey Wright from William Wright uh, mm-hmm. Commercial um, Real Estate, uh, he said the same thing as you. He said, you know, focus on your strengths and, mm-hmm. you know, bring in other people uh, to pick up. Well, uh, very hundred percent, hundred percent. Make sure that they mm-hmm. have they're strong in areas. I guess mm-hmm. where you're where you're weaker, mm-hmm. but yeah. mm-hmm. um, that's so important. Mm-hmm. I was uh, something I'm always curious about because um, my my career is still fairly young. Mm-hmm. You know, the company's been around eight years, um, and so you know I look at something like your career or William, and, and I this the 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 pivots that you have to make as you grow. You know, you're on the bicycle. You run that bicycle. You're doing everything. Correct. Now there's three people. Jack Welsh from GE said um, a good manager can, I think he said, kind of a, a decent manager can manage about five people. There's an exceptional one that can do ten. That's what they thought of GE. So, you know, and there's different sort of schools of thoughts on that. But what kind of pivots did you make over the years to go, okay, I need to let like, okay, these are my weaknesses, but at one point you had to manage your weaknesses because you're the only one doing it. And then through the years, you have to let go, let go, let go. It, it, it's some, I, I know people that have a very tough time with, you know, they've been in business for 50 years and they cannot let go. Like, it's tough for them. Was it hard for you? I, I won't tell you my daughter's age, but my daughter has been in the business since she was nine years of age with me. Um, obviously, she went to school and all that kind of stuff, so she did have some sort of a life. Um, She developed herself uh, up to the point where she was uh, 17 or 18 when we were living in Kingston. And uh, she decided that she wanted to stay in Kingston because she was managing two bars for friends of ours down there. And uh, she had an awesome job. But when she said, look, I want to stay here, uh, but I'd be be out to Vancouver because my wife and my son was moving to Vancouver. I was already there. And uh, she said, but when, uh, sorry, when I will be ready to move to Vancouver in two years. And uh, so I was happy with that because of the fact they gave her a different, you know, diff- there's another world, right? So she, um, two years practically to the day she was out, uh, I was working from Unilever. You couldn't, there's a rule in Unilever, you can't have a relative report to you. So we had her working out of the Winnipeg office, but she really was in Vancouver. Um, and uh, so she did another two years with them. That's when I, well, I was working and building the business up. And then, so therefore, she was there for the transition in 2022. 
right? Uh, my point being is that she uh, then developed her whole, uh, basically, she, she got herself uh, educated. So for example, when I promoted her to uh, president of the company through a lot of steps in a lot of years, I think maybe three years ago, uh, we brought her into her first business meeting and uh, like a serious business meeting, like how serious is that business meeting? It's serious because when I leave it, I'm confused. These guys, these number guys, I don't know what they're talking about. As I always say, that like Tom Cruise said one time, it was a Tom Cruise, show me the money, that's it. But anyway, um, she came out and I said, well, what do you think? And you know, they were doing P&Ls and forecasts and all that. And she said, that, I, I said, what do you think? She said, Dad, she said, I'll be honest with you. She says, I need to go to university, like now. So mother of two children, uh, went to university at nighttime to Simon Fraser one, did a master's in accounting, right? And I think 18 or 19 months later, got her, passed, passed, got her master, got her degree. Um, you know, I know her husband had a lot to do with this as well, as did her mother, like, you know, watching the kids. But, uh, you know, she got her degree and all that kind of stuff, right? Okay. So my point is trying to, um, that's a long, a long stretch to get there, right? Is, yeah. That's a person that, that is focused and knows what they want to do. As she was transitioning into take over as president of the company, I was the guy, just like William, that gets a phone call every five seconds. Oh, I put the screw in the wall. Which way do I turn it? Like ridiculous questions, right? Okay. And, but very important because your staff member doesn't know how to do it. So now you realize that so you fix it. The point about it is, is that you, uh, so this is in there. She's trying to do her thing and making decisions. And immediately I'm not accepting that she's making decisions. So that took about six months for us, many a chat for us to uh, get over. Uh, many times, you know, my wife would you know, sit down and she'd be the referee against the two of us. Um, being my daughter, you know, I won't tell you that she's easy, you know, she's uh, soft. She's very uh, stubborn, just like her father. So I'm to blame. That's my point with regards to that, right? Okay, so, you know, so you do run into those problems. It's hard to get them up. I've, I've just turned 60 and a bit, 65 actually. People say to me, you know, when are you retiring? I'm never going to retire. I can't retire. If I retire, it's going to cost me a lot of money. And here's why it'll cost me a lot of money. My wife is going to divorce me for being at home every day, right? And she's going to take 50% of everything I got, okay, automatically. And find a younger man. So, um, no, so I'll always be involved. I uh, recently had a conversation uh, with them, and I've given myself a new title. Not only am I CEO and founder, but as I said to Melissa and her team, I am also manager of uh, special projects and special events. And somebody says, well, what is all that, John? And I said, very simple. I said, I'm the manager of special projects and special events. You've got to bring them to me, okay? And then uh, I'll make the decision. Sorry, I manage your special events and special projects, right? And I make the decision on special events and special projects, whether we do them or not. So basically, the, the, bottom, the bottom line is, that's my way of retiring from being the president or CEO or founder of a company. Now I'm manager of special events and special projects. Nothing wrong with that. That's good, right? But part of it was will it, the willingness. Let's take you saying your your wife had to play referee. I mean, I'm guessing that some of those chats got pretty intense, um, and you sort of need to be willing to do that because it is your baby, you know. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. And I would like to think that due to the amount of time and dedication my daughter had put into it, it's her baby as well, yeah. right? You know, she's very, very much involved and she runs her own stuff. It's not, there's no secrets between us, you know what I mean? We'll try and get time at least once every two weeks, if not once a week, where we'll sit down and have lunch and, uh, and uh, go through, you know, ongoing issues. I, I like to know what the gossip that's going on because we deal with about 60 different companies now. So I like to know what's going on, you know, behind the scenes kind of thing. And, um, yeah, and, 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 and you know, she, so she's very informative, like, that's concerned, right? How do you, how yeah. do, you do know each other? Um, I guess we, we first met here through the Irish community. Um, mm -hmm. Celtic Fest, maybe. Mm -hmm. John Wren uh, Celtic Fest, which is a very famous uh, 
um, one of the organization events. that yeah that does yeah a lot of special events and uh, the big one I suppose is St Patrick's Day March seventeenth yep. every year or that week. Uh, you run it, John, for how many years? Uh, three, four, three, three or four. Three or four years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we bring in entertainers from from abroad as well. Like, yeah, so we, we've got that. great experience. John came to me looking for money. I think. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> It's a little donation for the event. Unfortunately, the money wasn't going into my pocket. Huh? Uh, look, yeah. That's a joke. Yeah. But, uh, John, tell us, how many cities are you working in at the moment? Transco. Well, Transco goes, uh, today we go from the Alaska border all the way down to the Mexican border. So I have, I know it says 14 in there, but I've got 17 warehouses uh, down there, approximately 180 to 200 trucks, which will include tractor and trailers. Um, yeah, great teams. Uh, next week, for example, we will have what we call a kickoff. We're actually kicking off our ice cream uh, season next week, but we'll be in California, so it'll be hot. <laughs> all right? <laughs> so we have all our staff come into that, as in, I'm sorry, all the U.S. Uh, Southern, Albert, Southern California staff come into that. Uh, and then on, the, so on a Tuesday, then on a Thursday, we're up in Tacoma, and we have all our Pacific Northwest staff come in there. Um, I haven't been at this for the last three years, so I felt compelled to go, so I am going this time, uh, along with Melissa and, and, uh, and my U.S. management team. Um, and then, uh, so 17 warehouse, 200, approximately 200 employees, 180, 200 trucks, uh, kind of thing uh, down there. And uh, right now, I would say in the not too distant future, there'll be an extra, uh, uh, st what do they call them, provinces, no state down there that would be taken over, but we'll wait. And uh, what, do, what do they say? Shut mouth, catches no flies, <laughs> right? But, uh, and then in Canada, it's a completely different story. Uh, in Canada, which is what I don't do in the U.S. yet, is in Canada, we deliver to all the grocery stores. So anything that's selling ice cream out there, we deliver, we deliver there, right? Um, in the U.S., it's different to use warehouses, and it's, you know, I, I'll have to build another big warehouse down there, I suppose, to get that business, but we're very happy. The U.S. is a very profitable business, touch wood. Uh, Canada, uh, again, Alaska border, all the way down to uh, the U.S. border, um, and then we go all the way out to Alberta, and now what we've done for 2013, late 2013, early 2014, is that because of this big building I got going up, there's a lot of interest coming in, that what Transcoal can offer is complete service. Like literally, you're a manufacturer, you want to go to the, uh, you, you want us to distribute your product into stores, into Safeways and all that. We, can, we now have the capability of just going to your warehouse, picking up the tractor trailer load, and then bringing it back and then shipping it out for you wherever you want it to go. If it's a listed product with Safeway, Costco, or anything like that, we'll even do one better. We will come in. We will uh, pick up the product. Uh, we will buy the product. We will pay you for the product, and then we will sell it to Costco. So <clears throat> what has developed from that, that service alone is uh, 2024, we're all looking for uh, more efficient and cost uh, ways, and we're also looking at emissions and the air and all that kind of stuff. So, Transcold, as in an, you know, and if, if we only had one, let's say we only had a Unilever, we would say to the storekeeper, well, I can't stop the truck for under $500, right? But if I'm carrying, which I am, Unilever, Chapman's, a uh, slew of other ice creams, that customer in this day and age can turn around and order take a choice of the four companies, but still order $500. So for my friend down here in the corner store right here, that's good for him, right? Now he gets variety, bigger variety, mm -hmm. and more convenient. And let's take it way up to the big guys, the Walmarts of the world, uh, that's very good for them too, because instead of them having four trucks from different companies going to their dock and taking up time and uh, all that pollution going into the air, now they have one truck with, with four different products on there for them, right? 
And so if you go to Walmart, I, 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 I'm glad to say, or if you go to Sobeys, um, to the buyer, you're the seller. But you go into the, the uh, into Sobeys, what the buyer will say to you, you want to get your product listed with us? We're very interested in listing your product. I need you to talk to Transcode, right? Because they don't want... Uh, they don't want four trucks going there, right? right. And then what will happen is they'll call Melissa up and say, listen, Melissa, talking to this guy, we're going to list a product. I want you to buy it off of him, right? And, and then the negotiation kind of starts from there, right? Sure, sure. So that's the big future, we'll say, you know, in, in, in our business, right? I mean, um, there's lots of, uh, having to say the same thing, there's lots of stuff in the future that's going to be causing a major amount of problems because they haven't researched it enough. And one of them is, is that, for example, if our politicians has their way, and they're already trying to do their job, right, we all have electric trucks beside the door. That's great. I drive a Tesla. I think it's one of the best cars I've ever driven, right? But when you come to a five-ton truck that's electric, that's great. But what happens is whoever did the testings on the five-ton trucks out there tested them empty going up and down the highway. They never, they never put a load on there, right? So load could be, as, a, as indicated, a five ton. So the maximum load would be five tons. But nobody tested a truck full with five tons. You know what I mean? Going up and down. All these trucks drive great. Some guy says, why don't you put something on the truck? They put it on. <laughs> Boom. Died. <laughs> Died right or killed it. Killed the egg. But anyway, um, so the future of the business and, and where the business is going and, and all of that is... Uh, is a very positive uh, to the point, but it would not be positive, right, if we didn't focus on it, if our team didn't focus on it, if Melissa wasn't focused on it, um, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a positive future for us. So right? that warehouse, I was wondering, did that some of those new opportunities now for the distribution was that part of the plan, or was that a by, is that a byproduct of just making that space, you know, the build that they will come scenario. It was part of it was a build, build and they would come and and uh, other of it other of it which is goes back to our earlier questions about being an entrepreneur and all that was asking questions. Don't be frightened to ask questions, uh, and ask them to the right people. So, for example, we would have asked a good couple of major companies, which would remain nameless, saying, "Listen, this is what we're thinking of doing, man. It's going to cost me X amount of millions of dollars. Can you give me any advice?" You know what I mean? What advice would you give us? Oh, I think it's a great idea, right? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we get, get all our products into one spot. So I was like, you know, Whitman, I was like, uh, build it big. And they built it big, right? So your kid's growing up, and William would bring his three sons out there. We'd bring them out. The favorite thing they want to do is you walk them in, and you just show them this freezer, and it's full of ice cream up and down <laughs> every aisle, right? And there's... Big forklifts inside her. Right? Every kid loves me. Right? Somebody says to me, he just says, John, there's Santa Claus and then there's you. Right? Okay? Right? So I bring kids in all the time and all that kind of stuff, uh, you know, that uh, we, we do. We had another shout, a little bit of a shout out for my ice cream factory I have in Vancouver. It's on Manitoba Street. And uh, that's a, a, a great example um, of entrepreneurship. Uh, would be that when I took over the business about 12 years ago, uh, it was small, and, and so we I worked in it, and I, when I say I, I mean my team and I, we worked in it and got it going and all that. But one of the things that happened was there was the previous owner was making these small cakes, and uh, they were just plain, and the idea behind it was he was selling it uh, to the restaurants, and so the restaurants could decorate it themselves, and um, he'd have them for sale in the store. And uh, so basically, this gentleman friend of mine, uh, a broker, come down to me, and uh, we'll call him Ross. Uh, and uh, Ross says to me, one day just showed up, and normally come down for a chat or whatever, a very, very smart uh, gentleman. And uh, he uh, comes in to me, and he says to me, he says, uh, after a 15-minute conversation, he said, Johnny says, uh, what's the story in those cakes, anyway? And I said, oh, the cakes, I oh, yes. I sent them to restaurants. I said, you know, it's okay. You know, it does okay. Uh, you know, we don't do anything big. Transcold isn't even carrying them right now at the moment, right? So anyway, he said to me, he says, uh, oh, so he said, you don't decorate cakes? And I said, decorate cakes. I said, geez, it's a waste of time, man. You know, there's guys out there that does that, like, you know. 
I couldn't be doing it. I couldn't wrap my head around it. So, end of conversation. He, he left, said her goodbyes. He gets into the car, and as he's getting into the car, I said, you're an idiot. Here I'm thinking that, oh, shit, he must have just come down for the cake because it's, uh, it's his granddaughter's or grandson's birthday, and they want the birthday cake, right? So I call him up. I said, Ross, listen to me, man. Come back. I said, so listen to me. I said, you asked me if I decorated cakes. I said, listen, come down, take the cake, bring it to Safeway, get Safeway, give them 10 bucks, and they'll decorate it for you. I've done this before, right? He said, <clears throat> no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. <clears throat> My mind now is just, you know, I wasn't even. I said, come on down. He said, but listen, you did misunderstand me. He says, I'm coming back. So he comes back to me anyway, and he says to me, he says, yeah. He said, I asked you why you would, why, if you decorated cakes. He says, because we've got a client at the moment in Western Canada. He's one of the only people other than Dairy Queen that makes commercial ice cream cakes, small ones. Um, he said, and, uh, but they decorated. Well, that company has gone bankrupt. So now they say, he says to me, the tunnel is empty, is getting empty. And the tunnel means is an imaginary tunnel from the factory to the store. So that gap inside there, stuff on delivery, you know what I mean? So, that, so the tunnel is getting empty. That's just a panic button for, for big stores like that. And uh, I said, uh, yeah, you know what, Ross, honestly, I don't want to get involved in uh, decorating cakes, right? I said, uh, you know, it's too messy, right? I need more people and all that kind of stuff, right? And he says, yeah, okay, I can see it. He said, but it's a, it is a good opportunity. And I just said, hey, how many cakes are you talking about? And he says, well, he says, about eight to 10,000 cakes. And I says, eight to 10,000? So that'd be less than 1,000 a month. No, he says, eight to 10,000 a month. I looked at him like this, but the same height as I am, right? And I said to him, I said, Russ, is there something wrong with your hearing? Why? I said, there must be something. Did, I, did you think that yeah. I said, I don't like decorating cakes? And he turns around and he says, well, he said, it's a waste of time. No, 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 no. I said, I'm the best fucking cake director and uh, decorator in Canada. No problem. When do you want me to start? To this day, I got that, I got that contract. I supply Sobeys, which is Save on Foods, IGAs, and I supply all of uh, uh, Save on Foods, I'm sorry, sorry, Safeway and IGAs, and then Save on Foods. I supply all the Save on Foods as well with my cakes. Wow. I sell them out of the store, and I think I'm pretty, I, I manufacture four pallets a day. Uh, let's say, so four pallets a day would be 80, 80, Four pallets a day times 20 is 400 uh, pallets a month uh, going out there. Yeah. I, I, I want to ask right now, when you hear that story, I've got, I've got a, I'm trying to grab which thought I wanted to keep the conversation going from with that story. W what are your thoughts when you're hearing this story? I think that's my first thought is that's John Coughlin, you know, um, no better man. If you ever come to John with uh, an issue, um, he's always happy to help and he can always solve the problem, you know, so, and I love the way, you know, he just pivots so quickly. Did you, he, you must have misheard me, you know, of course I can decorate cakes, cakes. I'm, I'm the best cake decorator in Canada, but, um, that's it. Just jumping on the opportunity, yeah. like, you know, strike when the iron is hot yeah. uh, and anything is possible. And look at the way, look at how successful that has been mm -hmm. uh, and talking to, talking to the right people. You said yourself, oh, yeah, you know, important. asking questions and yeah. listening. Yeah. Yeah, but what a great story. I never heard that story before. Mm -hmm. I know John for mm -hmm. a long time. And yeah, and there's little, there's little pockets of story, like little lessons within it. Is, and a couple I heard is, is, is one, um, a, a guy told me, one of his mentors um, said, like, always take a meeting. You know, that, that, you know, taking that time to actually meet and talk to people and, and thinking you misunderstood him. Calling him, say, hey, you know, not even about business, about it. You're thinking it was a personal thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. About. No, no, no. For sure. And yeah. Just that time, a lot of people would let would mm -hmm. not correct let that correction happen. Mm -hmm. They'd mm -hmm. go, oh, oh, that's too bad that I misunderstood him, and mm -hmm. they wouldn't have made that phone call to mm -hmm. call him and bring him back. Yeah. yeah. For a personal reason, though, not for business, not for money. And um, it's true. I, and we we can edit this part out if you don't want me repeating. But when you and I first talked mm -hmm. here, at, here at your mm -hmm. uh, your event. Mm -hmm. um, you said that uh, 
you said you've got contracts and that now, but there was over years you hadn't signed contracts yep. because you know it changes hands, and now the contract you're signing with this guy is not the same. Doesn't mean shit. Yeah, I know exactly. You're right. Person and yeah. just that there's this personal from talking yeah. to you privately, and now there's this yeah. personal element to you, which. Again, people think of business as this this sort of this. It's dollars and cents, and it is mm -hmm. that element, of course. Mm -hmm. But it's so much of it is how people yeah. perceive you. That personal relationship with people is just everything for, for any sort of sustainable. Sure. Yeah, I don't think. Well, I can't even think. I don't think I've got a vendor out there of people selling to me, right? Uh, that I wouldn't sit down and have a pint with. You know what I mean, right? Um, if I don't like the person, and normally I don't like people because they're either you know violent or you know rude or you know I that all the boxing gym, I promise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. <coughs> but uh, but you know, just you give me a bad taste when I'm out, and I don't want anybody. I don't care who they are. I don't. I want nothing to do with them. I'm too busy trying to you know solve my own issues or solve you know keep my keep my people happy. Then you know. Then so negativity is is another thing as well. We uh, both both Melissa and I don't put up with negativity. We're like, you know, sorry, too negative, yeah. right? Well, that's I that's the deposit. Within two minutes of talking to you. Yeah, 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 I'm a, yeah. Yeah, I must say, I, I know John for probably twelve or fourteen years now, probably, yeah. and uh, he's got a huge heart, and he's very kind, mm -hmm. and he su always supports anything we ask him to support. Uh, recently, I was at his house uh, for a visit with. Uh, Laura, my wife, and uh, he called us back in when we were going out the door. And he said, come here, come here, come here. I forgot to give you this for your kids. And he gave us one of those uh, ice cream cakes, which was absolutely delicious. By the did way, the boys like it, did it? Oh, they did. They want it every night before they go to bed. <laughs> I um, still like ice cream cakes. But, uh, come down, man. Take you know, care of you. You never leave empty-handed. And uh, that's just mm -hmm. John. So. I, I, wanted to, I, I want to build on something that you said, said though, sure. about... Because um, we talk about surrounding yourself with good people with your business. Right. So and I really want both your answers. This for, this is for, for me. This is my own mentorship. <laughs> the mentorship I need. You said about um, basically you don't you work with people you want to work with is what I heard. Yes. Um, and well, so first, William, I'd like to ask you, what is your approach to that? Because you know, over years, I've tried. I've tried to make relationships work that didn't work. Always ends badly. Yeah. Always every time, without exception. Um, and maybe not even because there's. You know, I don't maybe don't connect with them. Maybe they're okay with other people, but for whatever reason, it just doesn't fit. How do you approach that, especially in your business? Because you are dealing with so many different people. You've got sixty vendors. That's not an easy standard to kind of. But William, you're you're first. I'm really interested. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me is, uh, and I think you know what got me to this stage is maybe um, becoming a dad and having a family and uh, seeing my kids grown up so quickly. So life is short, is what I'm getting at. Mm. And why would I waste my time having a meeting or arguing with somebody that I don't even like doing business with? You know, yeah. uh, let's just focus on the people, as John said, that are positive, that are good people. Um, as you said yourself, nothing good ever comes from those relationships. It you know, if they're going that way and you're going that way and you're not aligned, it's not going to work out. You know, there's a very good chance it won't work out. So why even if the concept is good, exactly. The idea is good. So why waste your time? with that relationship. And business is, is as simple as trust and relationships. You know, we always say, uh, I said to our teams when I sit down with them, it's not about, it's not just about this project. It's about mm. the next project or the next deal. We have to think of the next one. But I see so many companies and businesses here and they're like, okay, we'll, we'll do this project for them now and we'll grind them and we'll get every penny out of them. And we'll, well you're in the contract. Yeah, and that's I a see big that all the time. Yeah. And we'll squeeze them for every last penny. And you know, we'll back charge them and there's no forgiveness and they never do a project together again. Oh. I want to be working with some of our mm -hmm. contractors. We've been working with them from day one. 90% of our business is repeat business. So when something goes wrong, you take responsibility. I say absolute responsibility. Yeah. Yes, you know, we're at fault here as well. How can we do to fix that? Okay, we, we discount your invoice. You know, what, what will you be happy with? As John said, communication, you know, open communication. But, um, I'm still a big be believer that the customer is always right, you know, uh, and the dividends. It, it does, it does, and uh, you have to work with the right people and surround yourself with the right people. Uh, my brother Sean always said, uh, "Your your net worth is your network," you know, 
and it's it's so that's very true, true actually it's so true yeah that's very very true and you and you ha- I, I guess to expand on that question though if because entrepreneurs are watching the show and and i've been in that so you probably all of us have probably been that where you know now i'm eight years in i, I can do a little picking and choosing now we we recently basically unloaded one of the biggest companies in canada we basically stopped working with them um and it's you know but it wasn't working it we, we did, tried it twice it was not working they just with different values. They just have a different value system than we do. Um, but eight years ago, I needed that money. Hundred percent. Like you know, so when did, did you have to? Did you have to sort of grin and bear it? Do you remember at a per, per certain time, or do you think someone listening to this should cut those ties if they don't have the right value, even if it's going to cost them, maybe cost them your business? Yeah, well, I know exactly what you're talking about. And uh, I will say in our early days, you know, there is some contracts that you might not enjoy doing, but you have to do them. You know, you need the money, you have to pay the bills. But as you grow and as you learn and as you um, create new relationships, better relationships, I think you, you have the opportunity to let them go. And I think, you know, sometimes they'll be surprised to sit down with you and say, you know, I want you to price this job and I want to buy tomorrow. And you say, do you know what? No. Uh, I can't commit to this. I'm actually busy for six months. Yeah. And they're like, uh, what do you mean? You know, you can't do that. You know, you say, uh, we can't. We're sorry. But yeah. I, I always uh, keep it respectful. But you think it you is know? okay? You oh, think I it do. is okay to, mm-hmm. to, to kind of bite the bullet in Most the first definitely. couple of years? You kind of have mm-hmm. to. Or, yes, yeah. I do. Yeah. I do, yeah. 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 What, do you, what do you think, John? I, just, uh, I had to, and again, I probably relate to my own experience. Uh, one thing would have been that... Uh, once I got involved in the ice cream business, uh, basically, you know, I got involved within six months. I was involved fully. It was my everything. Uh, a good example would be if anybody's familiar with the Ontario Winters, right? They have a hockey league down there called the OHL, Ontario Hockey League. Oh, yeah. And then these guys, so you'd have teams, or at Toronto, Oshawa was a big one, Belleville, uh, Kingston, Cornwall, right? And I went to these ice cream people, the Giddy, and I said to them, I said, listen, I need you to give me some of these fancy carts, maybe, you know, two of these fancy carts. And uh, I said, well, yeah, okay, why, why? What do you want to do with it? So I'm not telling you. I said, you agree to give me the carts first, and then you give me that you're not going to tell anybody about my idea, especially in my area, and then we'll be able to do it. Yes, John, no problem, ha, ha, ha. I said, I'm going to sell ice cream. And, and they said, I'm going to go to the Ontario Hockey League. I'm going to go to the guys that owns the arenas. And I'm going to go in there. And uh, I'm going to bring in the ice cream cart two hours before the game, set it up. And I'm going to physically go in and sell ice cream myself. We were a very small company at the time. And these guys that had been in the ice cream business at that time for over 40 years just thought I was nuts. And I said, listen. All I asked you for, I didn't ask you for a lecture. All I asked you for, very simple, was I asked you, right, to just give me some carts and let me just do it. Let me try it out. What's it costing you? Your carts are sitting in a warehouse, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I got three carts off them. I put one in, th- in Cornwall, I put one in Belvin, and I put one in, uh, in Kingston. Kingston games are easy. I just had to drive up the road, drive to my warehouse, get some ice cream, put it in there, and, and sell. The deal was that I show up for every game. But in Cornwall, which is two and a half hours away from Kingston, right, on the highway, right, you could have, like, flying, freezing rain, flying snow, the whole lot. I yeah. had one helper with me. This is how bad he got. We were driving a blue van at the time. And he would drive, because he's a better driver than I am. And I literally would go into the back of the van and lie down and hope to God I can go sleep because my nerves couldn't take driving that road in freezing rain, right? The shit that happens when when you're on a highway like that, right? So I go to Cornwall. I come back that night. We go to Belleville, come back that night. So I was gone these evenings, three evenings a week for about six months uh, going along. But the surprising thing was I was selling an average to four to six hundred dollars a night at these arenas from people that thought I was nuts. I I knew it because I figured out the game of hockey, not that I can play hockey, Right? So what happens with the hockey people? No disrespect, uh, sorry, yeah, no disrespect to the hockey people, right? But the guy my age, 60-odd, 
right? What happens to them is they go to that game every week, just like I'm sure at the, uh, what, what you might call it, the Maple Leafs or the games or the Canucks. Every week they go. And they have a system. And you have to understand the system. The system is they're at home, right? And they've got changed from work and all that kind of stuff, and they'll have a very small meal or whatever yeah. because they're looking forward to their treat, and their treat is the canteen. So then they come in, right, and they'll get their coffee, and they might get their donuts or, you know what I mean, whatever. And or else they'll come in and they'll get their coffee or their soft drink and they'll get a pizza, right? And they're inside for the first period munching away. And I'm selling 20 bucks worth of ice cream. I'm like an idiot, so standing there, right? But a lot of guys know me now, so we're chit-chatting. That's fine. First period is played. Second period comes along. Now, they've had their slice of pizza. They've had this. They've had that, right? And uh, so now they want something to eat. Now, now they're looking for dessert. Second period, right? Some of them are looking for dessert. They come out, buy the cone. And I used to have this bar, which you think today Purdy's is doing it. It is a vanilla ice cream bar, and you dip it in chocolate, and you roll it in nuts. Yeah. But the trick about that was, is that you don't just come along, get the bar, take off the wrapper, put it in, roll it in nuts, here you go. No. The trick is, you've got to take it out of the cart, and you've got to go. So everybody around can see what you're doing, and now you're putting on the show, right? Oh, what the hell is that guy up to? And then they come over, you dip it into the chocolate, and you lift it up like this. Because the minute the chocolate hits it, it's cold. So it hardens, right? You just turn it around. And if you can, you put a little swirl of chocolate like that. And then you go back in, set two dips. I found out the second dip was very popular, so I charged an extra buck for the second dip. <laughs> <laughs> I eat the chocolate and again, comes out, it's wet, I'd roll it in the nuts and I give it to the guy, right? So now you've kind of drawn a bit of a crowd. But that's the second, the, the first, sorry, the opening, for end of first period, right? Now, the big one, end of second period. When the second period is over, right? Okay? They've had the pizza. They've had the coffee. They've had all that kind of stuff that's in there. They had their chocolate bar and all that. Now it's ice cream time. And I'm going to tell you, from here to that door, I'd have a lineup. Two legs, like this, right? And what I do is, before the second period, is I get the inside of my cart and I put it all on the top, right? And all I'm doing there is I'm standing there, right? Two bucks, four bucks, three bucks, six bucks. And, I, and the guys are taking this stuff. Can I have a dip bar? No problem. I need a dollar tip for service charge. And I would be cracking jokes with these guys. I fucking great, great light numbers. Like when I tell you that I do four to six hundred dollars on average, right? That's a very low average. I'm gonna tell you that right now, right? But uh, but we did very, very good money doing it. But the point of the story is being a young entrepreneur that you have to do, you have to take those challenges and you have to go and get them done and you've got to show people you can do them by yourself, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that was, a not, that was a winter way of me getting money because all my money was coming in the summertime. I had nothing for the winter, right? Well, I did. I had the money that my wife, put, that my wife uh, took off me. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the ice cream truck coming there, John? That's my ice cream. That's my. That's my. Uh, uh, would be the ringtone. That's my. Uh, <laughs> that's my. Uh, that's my. You're phone. leaving that in. <laughs> anyway, so um, I, I hope that answers your question. What a brilliant yeah. story! And you know yeah. what? I was at a hockey game with Laura on a date about two weeks ago. Yeah. And you, what you said there basically happened. We had our coffee. We had our slice of pizza in the second period, and in the third, I said to her, "I'd love something else now." Uh, why don't we get a couple of ice creams? And that's exactly what we did. And you paid through the North Room as well, yeah. <laughs> but then, so, I, I, I challenge, I challenge, nobody has come back to me on it yet. And I mean this very humbly. I was the guy that started off selling ice cream bars in arenas. And I'll challenge anybody to that. Because anybody that I did challenge, no, 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 you weren't. Yes, I was. Well, we were selling them in Toronto. No, you weren't. Right? Okay. The bar, you know, it's that way. It was it's just it's, it's a it's a fun fun fact. How's that? Yeah. What a great idea for the winter time. Yeah. Yeah. For hockey. Yeah. No, it's I. No, John. Thank you for coming in. I'm, and I'm I'm very glad that we got a chance to meet before this because some of the other guests I haven't got a chance to know. So I, I kind of knew, you know, who was going to be sitting in that chair. So I kind of mentally was preparing for the fun. And it was I think funner even than I thought it would be. 
Um, and, and just thanks to you and to for putting this show together. You're very welcome. Um, because it's an honor. already you see these different guests coming in, people like yourself. It's just this every story. No, it's just yeah. yeah. People well, have I'm these glad, stories, glad but there's right these up. through lines of everybody that comes in. There's a mm-hmm. lot of honesty, self reflection. I'm willing to admit that you're wrong. Take chances. Yeah. <laughs> Learn from mistakes. Mm-hmm. It just seems to be in every, mixed in with no matter what the story is, there's a little bit of that mixed mm-hmm. in. So it's yeah. been pretty special. Thank you for your time, John. You're more than welcome. It's my pleasure. I hope the stories son. didn't bore you. But, uh, Not at all. all your success. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's an incredible story and well done. Oh, yeah. You should be very proud of yourself. Don't be saying I'm a success too often because now if my wife hears that word success too often, she's down to the store buying a new skirt or a dress. <laughs> It's going to kill me now when she sees I that. I won't say when she's around. You better edit that one. Put it right in the intro for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome, yeah.